On May 11th, 2007, 16-year-old Kevin Haynes practically bounced with excitement on his seat on the bus as he headed home from Mannheim Township High School outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His older sister Maggie had just come home from college the day before, and their dad was going to make his signature spaghetti and meatballs to celebrate her return. And if the Haynes family followed their tradition, they would also rent a family video after dinner and then maybe watch the Philadelphia Phillies baseball game. Kevin thought his Friday night lineup sounded great. Kevin and his sister Maggie were not super close, partly because Maggie was four years older, but Kevin looked up to Maggie. She was cool and stylish and so athletic, she actually ran for the Bucknell University track team. And Maggie admired her brother right back, even bragging about him to her college friends. Kevin was a straight-A student in his school's gifted program and a member of the school's quiz bowl team, which competed against other high schools to show who was the smartest. And his big sister had plans to make Kevin even better. This summer, she had promised to fix his nerdy fashion sense. She told him no more knee-high white socks with khaki shorts. Kevin chuckled to himself as he rode along at the idea that his sister was going to fix him. He was a very modest young man, his round face turning bright whenever he became the center of attention. And he would never brag. But Kevin knew that he was doing a lot of things right already. He was close to getting his Eagle Scout badge from the Boy Scouts, and he had just passed his driver's test. He was a homebody by nature, but he was emerging as a young man ready to take on the world. The evening before, he had gone to a meeting at his school about a class trip to Germany in July. Kevin's family, like so many in eastern Pennsylvania, traced their ancestry to Germany, and Kevin had always dreamed of visiting. Finally, it was actually happening, and best of all, his roommate on the trip would be one of his two best friends, Alec Kreider. Now, on the bus, he and Alec chatted excitedly about all the things they planned to do in Berlin, Germany's capital. When Kevin waltzed into the kitchen of his family's neatly kept middle-class home that Friday afternoon, he plopped his backpack down onto a chair and went to the refrigerator to look for a snack. He was daydreaming about Germany and pulling out the blueberry pie when his sister Maggie walked in and reminded him they needed to get Mother's Day cards for their mom. So Kevin wolfed down his pie, and then the pair drove off to a nearby strip mall to shop for cards. Kevin and Maggie often joked about how perfectly boring their family was, comparing themselves to the Cleaver family from the 1950s TV show Leave it to Beaver. Their father, Tom Haynes, was an industrial supply store manager who loved his work, while their mom, Lisa Haynes, taught preschool at a church school. None of them did drugs or drank much alcohol, and neither Kevin nor Maggie had ever had a serious romance. On Sundays, they all went to church. The Haynes family also prided themselves on leaving their doors unlocked, except when they went away for vacation. Their town was on the edge of Amish country, where the straight-laced Amish people still travel in horse-drawn wagons, and crime was so rare that many of their neighbors did the same thing. In Mannheim Township, people felt safe. But a boring lifestyle worked just fine for Kevin, Maggie, and their parents. They enjoyed each other's company and looked forward to being together. Both Maggie and Kevin were back at the house by the time their father, Tom, came blazing in promptly at five to start getting dinner ready. Tom had recently had surgery for prostate cancer, and he still had a catheter implanted, but you'd never know it by his good cheer and energy. At 5.30, the whole family gathered around the dining room table for pasta and lots of catching up. It was Kevin's mom, Lisa's, last day of preschool, and she had been touched by the gifts that her preschool students had given her. She planned to write notes back to all of her little scholars. Maggie talked about her professors at Bucknell, some she loved, others not so much, and everyone at the table talked about how glad they were that Maggie was home. They had missed her last summer when she stayed at college to work on a biology project. Kevin loved the dinner. His dad had a magic touch with the meatballs. But Kevin didn't love the family movie that night. Maggie and his mother had picked out a romantic comedy at the local video store, and Kevin groaned as soon as his mom pulled it out of the bag. He tried to watch it, but the film seemed sentimental and dumb to him, and he could feel his eyelids drooping about halfway through. So, not long after 9 p.m., Kevin told his family that he loved them, but he needed to go to bed. Maggie teased her brother as he headed for the stairs, saying he might be the only teenager alive going to bed so early. 
but Kevin didn't mind. He was going to read until he fell asleep. Maggie and her parents watched the rest of the movie. Then Maggie and her father stayed up a bit longer to watch the Philadelphia Phillies beat the Chicago Cubs. By 11, everyone retired to their bedrooms, passing Kevin's darkened room along the hallway. Tom and Lisa quickly fell asleep, but their daughter Maggie was still on a college student's schedule. She watched TV programs on her laptop and then chatted online with college friends until she finally nodded off around 1 a.m. An hour later, at a little after 2 a.m., Maggie was suddenly jolted awake by the sound of screaming. There were no words, just the ear-splitting screams of a man along with loud thuds as if people were wrestling. And all these sounds were coming from her brother's bedroom. Totally confused and now trembling with fear, Maggie grabbed her glasses from off the nightstand and stepped into the hallway to investigate. But the terrible noises coming from Kevin's room made her so scared that Maggie just ran back inside her bedroom, slammed the door, and sat with her back pressed against it. She tried desperately to make sense of what was happening amid all the screeching. Was there an intruder in the house who was attacking her brother? And if there was, what hope did she have of preventing the intruder from breaking into her room next? She couldn't just sit there and wait. So Maggie summoned all her courage and ran across the hall to her parents' room where the light was on. Her father was lying motionless while her mother was sitting at the end of the bed, hunched over and crying hysterically. When Lisa Haynes saw her daughter, she told her in a voice barely above a whisper, Go get help! Maggie didn't need to be told twice. She ran wildly down the stairs and out into the cool spring night, banging on one neighbor's door after another until finally one woman turned on a light and let her inside. Maggie told her that she had no idea what was going on inside of her house, but judging from her mom's hysterics, she feared it had something to do with her father's prostate cancer. And so whatever was going on, Maggie said, we need the police right now. Officer Steve Newman, working the night shift just weeks after finishing the police academy, got to the scene first. He went straight to the neighbor's house where Maggie had made the 911 call. Maggie was teary-eyed and dressed in a sweatshirt decorated with a cartoon penguin. And she was totally confused about what was going on in her house across the street. She said her dad might be having some kind of health crisis, or maybe there was a home invasion going on. When Newman left the neighbor's home and went across the street and rang the doorbell on the Haynes family home, no one answered. So he opened the unlocked door and went inside, mindful that an intruder could be lurking in the darkness. On the first floor, Newman, along with the second officer, saw nothing unusual except that the glass sliding door in the kitchen was open. Otherwise, the house was still. But as Newman climbed the stairs, gun drawn, he saw a spot of blood. Then he saw two more further up. As he reached the top of the stairs, he could see bloody footprints on the hallway carpet, and there, in the doorway of his bedroom, lay Kevin Haynes in his Boy Scout t-shirt, face down in a pool of blood. Newman could see that his throat and face had been severely slashed, while his arms were covered with knife wounds, as though he had put up a desperate fight to live. Both officers continued down the hall to Kevin's parents' room. There, they found Tom Haynes lying on his back on the bed, eyes staring up at the ceiling, deep stab wounds to his chest. At the end of the bed, curled up in the fetal position, lay Lisa Haynes. Lisa was still warm, and for a moment, Newman hoped she might be alive, but then he saw the deep gash on her throat. All three were dead. Detective Alan Leed grabbed the phone on the second ring when the 911 dispatcher called a little after 3 a.m. The 57-year-old detective called himself the old dog of the Mannheim Township Police, and he had plenty of experience answering emergency calls in the middle of the night. Bald and bespectacled, Leed could pass for a high school teacher, but in reality, he was a hardened investigator who had just finished investigating a shooting at a local tavern the day before. He was also a veteran of the Vietnam War who had learned a valuable lesson a long time ago. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. The other detectives looked up to Leed, and they often went to him for advice about their cases. The dispatcher told Leed that something terrible had happened at 85 Peach Lane. 
Lee did a double take when he heard the address. Peach Lane was in one of the most peaceful and pleasant neighborhoods in the whole town, an area where police were seldom called. He asked the dispatcher if it was some sort of domestic disturbance, and they just said, no, that's not what happened, you'd better get over there. Leed knew that the crime scene unit was poring over the crime scene, cataloging all the evidence. They didn't need Leed's help with that. He could check out the scene later. Right now, Leed needed to talk to the only surviving witness, Maggie. And by now, Maggie was on her way to the police station. So Leed got dressed, jumped in his car, and headed into the office. Maggie was already in an interview room talking to another detective when Leed arrived, and the detective excused himself to brief Leed on how it was going. The whole conversation was making him uncomfortable, the detective said. Maggie seemed relaxed and chatty, and she kept talking about her family in the present tense as though they were not dead. The detective said she didn't seem like a woman who had just lost her entire family. Leed looked through the one-way glass into the room where Maggie was still sitting, occasionally looking up and smiling in their direction. Other times, she smoothed her hair and sat with her hands folded on her lap as though she was just awaiting instructions. The other detective was right. She certainly did not seem heartbroken. But Leed said that the most important thing they could do right now would be to get as much information out of Maggie as they could. For all they knew, the killer could be planning to strike again, so time was of the essence. He asked the detective to get a written statement from Maggie that included everything she could remember about the evening, no matter how minor it seemed to her. The tiniest detail could turn out to be a critical clue. So the detective set Maggie up with a laptop computer and gave her an assignment. Tell us what happened. And Maggie took it to heart, typing page after page about everything that took place since she returned home from college. She wrote about the TV shows she watched and how her parents didn't understand the TV show Grey's Anatomy. She wrote about doing a crossword puzzle with her mother, and she wrote about the score in the Phillies game that she watched. But when Maggie got to the moment that she heard screaming from her brother's bedroom, her account became less and less specific. She never saw the intruder. She didn't realize her parents had both been stabbed even though she was in their bedroom with the lights on and she never investigated what was causing all the noise in her brother's bedroom. When she needed to describe her reaction to learning that her family was dead, she wrote simply, quote, and you know the rest, end quote. Leed and the other detectives didn't know what to think. Some details in Maggie's statement were touching, depicting an unusually close family. But it's a basic principle in police investigation that when a witness fills their statement with irrelevant details, they may not be telling the whole story. Lee didn't think of Maggie as a suspect, but it did seem odd that the killings came just two days after she returned home from college and that she was miraculously spared. It was also strange that she had seen so little of the loud, bloody attack unfolding all around her in her home. But Leed thought to himself that Maggie's performance was so bad that she had to be telling the truth. After all, if Maggie was connected to the crime in any way, wouldn't she put on a major display of grief to cover her tracks? As dawn broke over Mannheim Township, Leed was facing perhaps the most appalling murder case in his town's history, and he had little more to go on than the quirky personality of the lone survivor. The slaughter of a respectable family in a picture-perfect neighborhood where people leave their doors unlocked was an irresistible story to the national news media. By late on Saturday, May 12th, the same day as the murders, the crime was on CNN and other big national networks, all of them pointing out that the killer or killers were still at large. The people of Mannheim Township were scared that a psychotic killer was on the loose in their community and police started giving Maggie around-the-clock security protection. For Alan Leed and the other detectives working the case, the media coverage triggered dozens of calls from people who said they knew something about the crime, but almost certainly didn't. One woman called to report three Hispanic men in a black Chevy cruising the neighborhood near the crime scene. Perhaps they were involved. A man called to report two young people dressed in goth clothing who spit on him. Maybe they were the killers. One couple who called in actually volunteered the use of their bloodhound dog, Nellie, which initially seemed like a smart idea to lead. 
So Lead let Nellie sniff blood spatters at the crime scene and then turned her loose. And Nellie took her handlers, as well as the police, on a zigzagging tour of the business district before finally leading them to a burger restaurant that Nellie thought smelled delicious. And it was at this point that her handlers admitted that Nellie very likely had no idea where the Haynes' killer had fled. The police had no solid suspects, but their crime scene investigation at least gave them some clues. It appeared that the killer, or killers, had struck the parents first, then savagely attacked their son, Kevin, leaving blood everywhere, including on the bottom of the killer's shoes. That's what left the bloody footprints in the upstairs hall. If they could find the shoes that matched the prints, they would have their killer. Despite the extreme violence, there was no sign of robbery. Lisa Haynes's jewelry and other valuables in the house were undisturbed. Whoever killed the family had likely targeted them for some reason other than money. And the viciousness of the attack on Kevin specifically made police suspect that Kevin might have been the primary target. There was also one other disturbing detail at the crime scene. They found blood in the downstairs bathroom, as though the killer had taken the time to clean up before leaving the murder scene. Their killer, it seems, was not remotely in a hurry. Maggie's role in all of this, if any, remained a mystery. Almost immediately, rumors spread that a former boyfriend of Maggie's could be the killer, but Maggie had never had a serious boyfriend. Lead asked an FBI analyst to read Maggie's written statement to see if he saw signs of deception about the murders. The analyst said they did not. And so it seemed to Lead that people were gossiping about Maggie mainly because she was the only family member to survive. The police began interviewing everyone who knew the family, hoping that they might gain some insight into who would want to hurt them. But the Haynes family were a tough family to hate. Person after person reported how decent and friendly they all were and how they always tried to do the right thing. Kevin had two best friends, Alec, who he was going to Germany with, and Warren Tobin, who he had known since elementary school and ate lunch with in the school cafeteria most days. These three were so close that they called themselves the Three Musketeers. If anyone would know who might hate Kevin and his family enough to kill them, it would be Alec or Warren. But the detective who called them came away with few concrete leads. Warren, who was choking back tears, said that Kevin got along with everyone. He said Kevin didn't socialize much, but he was always helpful to his classmates and no one seemed to pick on him. Warren said all of the Haynes family members were extremely nice and he couldn't understand why they had been attacked. Kevin was even closer to Alec, who lived just a half mile away. Not only were they going to Germany together, but they were well known at the high school for their good-natured cafeteria debates about everything from religion to politics. But Alec said he was just as baffled as Warren. When Warren called him on Saturday with the horrible news, Alec said he initially thought Warren was just making a terrible joke. He said he couldn't think of a single person with a bad opinion of Kevin, except for perhaps a couple of students in math class who occasionally teased him. But it seemed like no big deal to Alec. In all their interviews, police found only one trace of ill will towards the Haynes family. One of Tom Haynes' co-workers said that Tom, in his role as a manager, had recently threatened a new employee with firing if his performance didn't improve. The co-worker said the two men got into an angry discussion behind closed doors in Tom's office, but when one of Leeds' detectives tracked down this new employee, he denied there had ever been any shouting or even any anger. And he had a perfect alibi. He and his wife were out late with another couple the night of the murders. So it was another dead end. Then on May 15th, so three days after the murders, Lead got a call from an alert trooper in North Carolina who had pulled over two men in their 20s for speeding and then discovered they had been smoking marijuana as well. One of the men volunteered, while high, that they were heading for Florida after, quote, getting away with murder in Pennsylvania, end quote. The trooper was aware of the Haynes family murders, and so he searched this vehicle closely until he found a knife. Both of these men were locked up in the Johnson County Jail, the trooper told Lead, if he wanted to send someone to question them. For the first time in four days, Alan Lead felt hopeful, and he practically skipped out of his office into the squad room to tell the other detectives about this new hot lead. He told them how one of these suspects even had lacerations on his right hand. 
The guy claimed the injury was from a sawmill, but those cuts could also come from violently murdering people. Lead told his team, we may have our killers. At Lead's request, the FBI had already done an analysis of the bloody footprints in the hallway that came from Size 12 Hush Puppies, a casual shoe brand. So Lead called the Johnson County Jailer and asked him to send a photocopy of the soles of the two men's shoes. The jailer was happy to oblige, and a few minutes later, Lead received a fax from North Carolina. The pictures were disappointing. The two men were wearing sneakers, not hush puppies, and neither was a size 12. But Lead knew they could still be the killers, so he asked for a DNA sample from both of the jailed men that could be compared with DNA from the crime scene. Once again, the jailer was happy to help, and once again, the results were disappointing. A few days later, the crime lab told Lead that none of the DNA from the men in jail in North Carolina matched the crime scene. They were not the murderers. Feeling very discouraged, Lead thought to himself, you know, maybe they were thinking about this case all wrong. The FBI had told investigators that the murders had the earmarks of a crime by someone who knew their victims, not a crime committed by strangers. The killer or killers had used a knife, which is a very intimate murder weapon, and the attack on Kevin seemed an act of pure hatred. And whoever had done this did seem to know their way around the house, likely knowing that the Haynes did not lock their doors. Maybe, Lee thought to himself, investigators needed to keep looking closer to home. On May 19th, so a week after the murders, people crowded into the Otterbein United Methodist Church for a memorial service for the Haynes family. It was a church that had long been at the center of the family's life. Kevin's grandmother was one of the church's founders, while Tom had served as a trustee. The crowd grew so large that volunteers hastily set up folding chairs at the back of the church to accommodate the overflow. All the while, a Pennsylvania state trooper videotaped everyone coming in the door, and local police were stationed all over the building just in case the killer might reveal themselves. Moments before the service was about to start, Detective Lead escorted Maggie and her other family members into the church where they somberly took a seat in the front row. The entire chamber immediately fell silent, except for the sobs of Warren Tobin's sister. The pastor spoke about the mystery of evil and the promise of the afterlife for the faithful Tom, Lisa, and Kevin Haynes, providing some comfort amid such a staggering loss. But then the pastor invited Lisa Haynes' brother to the podium, and his message sent a shiver through the entire congregation. He talked about the profound impact the murders were having on the Haynes family, as well as the larger community, and he called on the killer to come forward and ask Maggie for forgiveness. He said the killer might even be here right now at this memorial service, posing as a grieving friend or loved one. For Kevin's friend, Alec, who was seated with the German teacher who would have chaperoned Alec and Kevin to Germany that summer, the message that the killer might be in that room was overwhelming. By the time the service was over, Alec had balled up his fists, his face was glowering, and when several girls tried to comfort Alec and give him a hug, he grew rigid and stepped back. Alex stalked off to his father's car where he sat fuming, and when his dad got in, he asked what was going on. Alex said he was furious at all the hypocrites in the service who never cared about Kevin when he was alive, but now that he was dead, everyone was acting so sad in public like he mattered to them. But he didn't. They didn't care. And in fact, Alec was now convinced, like Lisa Haynes' brother, that the killer had to be one of those hypocrites. They were there in the church. He knew it. By May 22nd, so 10 days after the murder, Lead and his team were no closer to making an arrest, and the detectives were starting to disagree amongst themselves about how to move forward. Several believed that Maggie had not told them everything she knew. Maybe Maggie was not involved in the crime, but she could be holding back details about the family's history or something that happened on the night of the murder that could help them solve the case, and so they wanted to bring Maggie back to the police station for more questioning. Lee didn't like the idea. Maggie had answered their questions over and over again, often giving investigators more details than they really wanted. What more could she have to say? 
and Lead feared that Maggie might have a serious emotional breakdown if they asked the same questions again as though they didn't believe her earlier answers. But Lead ran the team like a democracy, and when the other detectives outvoted him, he agreed to question Maggie one more time. At 11 a.m. that morning, Lead walked into an interview room and sat down across from a now somewhat resentful Maggie Haynes. But to Lead's surprise, Maggie did have more to say. As Lead asked question after question in his gentlest voice, Maggie energetically responded. As Maggie recalled the unfolding attack on her family, she said she could smell the blood when she stepped from her bedroom out into the hall. When she got to her parents' room, she couldn't see any blood, she said, but her mother was so upset that when she asked her to go get help, Maggie didn't ask any questions. She just went and got help. In the moments after Maggie had learned that her parents and brother were dead, she said the first person she wanted to call was the head of her prayer group at college. She wanted to know why God would let something so terrible happen. And then Maggie started to cry. By the time she walked out of the police station, Alan Leed was convinced of two things. One, Maggie had nothing to do with the crime. And two, she had told them everything she knew. Over the next two weeks, tips about the Haynes murders continued to come into police, but the results were much the same. They put a microphone on one informant who claimed that a guy named Amani had confessed to invading the Haynes' home and then, quote, taken care of, end quote, the people inside. But after two weeks of eavesdropping on Amani's conversations, all police heard about was Amani bragging about women, drugs, and guns. He did not seem to know anything about a triple murder. Meanwhile, one of Kevin's best friends, Alec Kreider, who had become really angry at the memorial service, convinced the killer was amongst them, he started to break down. In the first days after the killing, his parents worried that he was keeping his grief about Kevin's death inside, becoming even more silent and withdrawn than usual. Alec had never had an easy time expressing his feelings, and he didn't have a lot of close friends aside from Kevin and Warren. And then, in early June, three weeks after the murder... Alec began talking about suicide on the phone with a girl he had a crush on. Her name was Carolyn. On June 5th, he told Carolyn he had a loaded gun and he didn't think he was going to make it through the week. Carolyn's heart started racing when she heard this because she feared Alec really was going to kill himself, maybe even on the phone with her at that very minute. She managed to get the attention of her aunt who lived with her and she let her know that she had a suicidal boy on the phone. Carolyn gave her aunt Alex's address and said she had to go there to warn Alex's mother. Carolyn then kept Alec on the phone until her aunt spoke to Alex's mom and Alex's mom called 911. When Alec finally came out of his bedroom, there were several police officers waiting who tackled him and then handcuffed him to prevent him from hurting himself. Detective Lead had come with the 911 response when he heard the call in part because he knew Alec better than anyone else in the department from the Haynes investigation. Lead walked next to Alec as he was gently led out of the house towards a squad car, and as he walked, Lead put his arm around Alec and just said, you know, how are you doing? And all Alec would say was, the world is a terrible place. As police helped Alec step into the squad car, Lead thought about the way the murders were totally upending the lives of the people who survived. Lead was convinced that Maggie was on the edge of a breakdown, and now one of Kevin's closest friends was cracking up. He couldn't help but agree with Alec. The world is a terrible place. The next day on June 6th, Alec was involuntarily committed to a mental hospital to be held for at least a week. For the next six days, Alec was kept in a locked ward and not allowed to have any contact with anyone outside of the hospital except for his parents. All the while, Alec wrote letters that he intended to send to Caroline. Finally, on June 12th, Alec's parents were scheduled to come to the hospital for a family therapy session, and Alec was looking forward to seeing them. But Alex's parents had bad news. Carolyn did not want to have a romantic relationship with him. After all the suicide talk and threats of violence, Carolyn's aunt told them that the teen only wanted to be friends, nothing more. The second Alec heard this, he seemed to just crumple in his chair and let out a laugh that was anything but amused. He looked at his parents and told them bluntly to get out of the room. 
he needed to speak to his therapist alone. The therapist was only in the room with Alec for a few minutes before she emerged looking like she had seen a ghost. She told Alex's parents that Alec really needed to tell them something, and what Alec had to say would blow the Haynes family murder case wide open. Based on what Alec and his parents told investigators, here's what really happened to Tom, Lisa, and Kevin Haynes on the night of May 12th. A little after 1 a.m., the killer got dressed in dark clothes, including a baseball hat with duct tape over the team logo and hush puppy shoes. Then they grabbed a flashlight and a knife and began the relatively short walk to the Haynes' household. When they got there, the killer knew the door would be unlocked, so they opened it up and silently walked through the house up the stairs towards the bedrooms. First, the killer went into the parents' room and quickly killed Tom Haynes with two deep stab wounds to the chest. The killer also stabbed Lisa Haynes, but she was still alive when the killer left the room. The killer then walked down the hall to Kevin Haynes' room, and he began stabbing him as he slept. But Kevin woke up and began to fight back. Kevin managed to get out of his bed and began crawling towards the door, but the killer caught up to him and then mortally wounded him with a slash to the throat. The screams that woke Maggie up were the sounds of her brother's dying moments. Maggie's appearance in the hall surprised the killer, who didn't realize she'd be home from college. But once she fled to get help, the killer forgot about her and just went back to the parents' room and slashed Lisa's throat, killing her as well. The killer then walked downstairs and casually washed their hands in the bathroom before slipping out the sliding glass door in the kitchen back out into the night. Alec had been carrying his horrendous secret around for weeks until he just couldn't bear it any longer. His rage over what had happened had grown day by day until he couldn't take it anymore and he decided to kill himself. But when he ended up in a mental hospital and got rejected by the girl he liked, Alec realized there were worse things than being dead. With no way to die and nothing to live for, Alec decided he might as well tell the secret. And the secret was that he, Alec, was the killer. Alec offered almost nothing in way of explanation for what he had done. He said only that his best friend, Kevin, had been annoying him lately, chewing too loudly at lunch and arguing a bit too much in their conversations. Alec said that initially he planned only to kill Kevin and smother him with a pillow. But once he got inside the house, he just decided to stab everyone to death. A month later, he told his parents he felt no regrets. In fact, he was still wearing the hush puppy shoes he wore the night he murdered the Haynes family. All the pieces now fit into place for Detective Lead and his team. Alex's shoes matched the bloody footprints, and police found the flashlight as well as the baseball hat with duct tape over the logo in the woods behind the Haynes' house. They also found a ghastly note in Alex's desk at his house. The note said that Alexander, which is Alex's full name, was born at 3.30 a.m. on May 12th, right after the murders, as though the slaughter had led to Alex's rebirth. Alec pled guilty to three counts of first-degree murder in 2008, and he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Then, in January of 2014, Alec made good on his suicide threats, hanging himself in his prison cell. Nicknamed the Great Grey Green Greasy, the Limpopo River is one of Africa's largest rivers. It serves as a border between Zimbabwe and South Africa, and it also happens to be one of the most dangerous places on Earth. A town in South Africa called Falaborwa sits on Limpopo shores, and all of its residents know they're never supposed to step foot inside of the dangerous waterway. But not all of their residents take that guidance seriously. On January 1st, 2010, Falaborwa resident Mariska Beitendog, along with her boyfriend and six of their other friends, had been out all night partying celebrating the new year. 
They had had a considerable amount of alcohol over the course of the night, so as the sun was coming up, in their inebriated state, they decided they wanted to take an early morning dip in the Limpopo River. So they head over to the river, and while initially they all seemed really eager to get in the waterway, it was only Mariska that was brave enough to do it. So the rest stayed on shore, and Mariska jumped in the river and jumped right out again. And she survived, and everyone was very impressed with her. So she's confident, and so she does it again, this time going a little bit farther out into the river before coming back on shore. Now she's really confident. She's done it twice. And so she said, hey, who wants to come with me for a third time in? And the group said, no, we're still good. And you really shouldn't push your luck. This is not safe. And she said, I don't care. I'm going in for a third time. So Mariska gets in the water and by herself, she swims out on her back about 15 meters away from shore. She turns and waves at the group and smiles before she is violently pulled under the water. There wasn't even time for her to scream. Her boyfriend immediately jumped into the water to try to pull her out, but he knew where she was, and there was no way he was getting her back. The other nickname for the Limpopo River is Crocodile River, and Mariska unfortunately had fell victim to one of its apex predators. But it's not just drunk partygoers that fall victim to these crocodiles. Unfortunately for the residents of Zimbabwe, because of the extreme hardships they have to face, many of them have been forced to flee the country and cross over the Limpopo River to try to gain entry into South Africa. And many of them will die trying. On April 11, 2014, Zimbabwean and South African police discovered this crocodile-infested cave right near where Zimbabwean residents will try to cross over the Limpopo River. And inside of this cave were the remains of 15 people that presumably tried to cross over and were caught by crocodiles. The discovery of this cave and the 15 people who lost their lives inside of it, while tragic and certainly gruesome, it only represents a fraction of the total number of people who have died trying to cross this river. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called No Way Out. In 1986, 35 million Americans went to see the brand new movie Crocodile Dundee, which was a comedy that starred this very capable and rugged Australian crocodile hunter who goes to New York City. One of the 35 million Americans who saw this film was a 24-year-old model from Virginia named Ginger Meadows. And after seeing this film, Ginger felt inspired to actually go to Australia to see it for herself because it looked so amazing in this movie. So a couple of months later, in March of 1987, Ginger, by herself, hops on a plane and flies to Perth, which is a major city in Western Australia. And her plan was she would land in Australia and then work odd jobs to make a little bit of cash and then use that cash to fund her travels all over the country. And then at some point, after she was tired of doing that, she would head back to the United States. So she lands in Perth and immediately she sees her first opportunity to make some money. There had been this huge sailing competition in the city leading up to the weekend she arrived there, and so she saw all these luxury yachts anchored at all these docks along the coastline, and Ginger's thinking to herself, you know, these huge ships, they have crews that work on them basically full-time. Maybe one of these boats could use an extra set of hands. And so Ginger, who was very friendly and outgoing, she went right down to one of these docks, and she stopped in front of the very first yacht she saw, which was this huge luxury 100-foot yacht, and she introduced herself to the captain of this boat and she said hey you know can I hitch a ride with you guys to the next place you're going and in exchange I'll work for you and as it happened the captain was actually looking for another crew member to assist their chef and so he said okay well can you cook and Ginger said yeah I'm a great cook and he said okay well you're hired you can be the chef's assistant and so Ginger she climbs on board and she meets the rest of the five other crew members including the chef who she'd be working with and the chef's name was Jane and those two would become very close and then shortly after Ginger had come aboard the captain cast off their lines and they headed out to sea their next stop was going to be New Guinea, which was roughly 14 days of travel away. After about a week at sea, the captain realized they were dangerously low on fresh water, and so he decided to take a detour and turn east and head inland along this river system that would bring them to this large freshwater pool, which he also knew had this huge waterfall that dumped down into it, and so he figured they could go right underneath this waterfall and fill up their jugs with all this fresh water and then head back out and they'd be good. 
So on the morning of March 29th, the captain anchored the yacht out at sea near the mouth of this river system, and then he lowered the yacht's dinghy, which was a smaller, more agile boat. And once that was in the water, he, Ginger, Jane, and the rest of the crew, they hop in this dinghy along with all these large, empty water jugs, and they begin making their way towards this river. And so they're traveling up this river for a little while, and then finally they get to this huge freshwater pool, and right in front of them is this amazing waterfall, and everybody is just totally awestruck by this waterfall. It's like a gem in the middle of nowhere because they're in very rugged Australia at this point. And so the captain, he brings the dinghy right near the base of the waterfall and one by one, they hold up their water jugs and they fill them with fresh water. And then they're about to turn and go back out to sea and get back on their yacht. When the captain thinks to himself, you know what, we've been at sea for seven days straight. It's been very monotonous. Maybe it would be a good thing to stick around here for a little bit longer and maybe even hike up to the top of this waterfall and enjoy the view and kind of enjoy the scenery before we head back out to sea. And so he says to his crew, hey, do you guys want to go to the top of this waterfall? And everyone agrees it's a great idea, with the exception of Jane. She did not feel like hiking to the top of this waterfall. She said she would stay down in the dinghy and wait for them. Now, this pool is basically surrounded on all sides by just pure cliff face. There really is no place to land this dinghy. There's no flat surfaces. You basically have cliffs that go directly into water, and then also you have the river that feeds back out to the ocean. So the captain brings the dinghy right up against the cliff face right next to this waterfall, and he and Ginger and the other crew members not named Jane climb out of the dinghy onto this cliff face, and they begin climbing, literally climbing up this wall towards the top of the waterfall. Now, everyone was able to do it except for Ginger. She kept slipping on the rocks. It was very steep. It seemed kind of dangerous. And so at some point, she abandons the idea and goes back down to the dinghy with Jane and the captain and the rest of the crew, they continue up towards the top. And so as Ginger and Jane are sitting in the dinghy watching the other crew members making their way up, they start feeling a little bit left out. And they're like, you know what? Let's try to find an alternate way up to the top of this waterfall. And so they begin scanning out across this pool at the other cliffs kind of surrounding it. And it looked like on the very other side of the pool, there was a less severe cliff face that maybe they would have an easier time climbing up. And so the two women, they jump into the murky brown water and begin swimming directly across this pool towards this other cliff. And when they make it about a third of the way, Jane suddenly stops and Ginger notices and turns around and looks at Jane and she's like, what's going on? And Jane would tell her, you know, something just feels off. This doesn't feel right. Let's go back to the dinghy. Let's just forget about this. But Ginger is like, come on, we're so close. Let's just keep going. It'll be awesome once we get to the top of this waterfall. And so Jane, she's totally hesitant, but she says, okay, fine. And they both continue to swim. And then all of a sudden, they hear their captain, who is now on top of the waterfall, screaming down to them to get out of the water right now. And they notice he is pointing down at the pool in a direction slightly away from where they were. And so they're looking up at him and they're following his finger down to the part of the pool he's pointing at and they see there is this tidal wave of water coming towards them. It is a 12 foot long saltwater crocodile that has noticed them and it is charging straight at them. Now, Jane and Ginger knew they were too far away from the dinghy to be able to swim to it before this crocodile was going to reach them. And so their next best choice was just to turn and swim towards the nearest cliff face. Because again, there is no place to get out of the water. There's only cliffs. And so they swim towards this cliff face, which is right on the edge of the bottom of the waterfall. And so water is landing on them and they reach the cliff face and they're trying to climb up and pull themselves out of the water. But there's nowhere to grab onto. It's all totally slick. There's no good handholds. And so all they have is this little ledge that is in the water that they're standing on, but they're still halfway into the water. And so after they struggle for a minute trying to pull themselves out of the water and they realize they can't do it, they both just turn around and they lock arms and they look out through the water that's falling down in front of them into the pool and they see this crocodile has followed them and it is now stopped right on the other side of the water that's falling down and it's just staring at them with its mouth wide open. And the two women are looking at it. They don't know what to do. And the captain and the other crew members, they see what's going on. And they're trying to climb down as fast as they possibly can to try to rescue them. But it's going to take several minutes at least before they get down to the dinghy. And so Jane and Ginger, they're totally aware of this. And they're just staring at this crocodile, screaming at it, trying to get it to go away. And at some point, the crocodile does just close its mouth and sink below the surface. But now they don't know where it is. And this causes Ginger to completely panic. And she 
lets go of Jane's arm and she dives into the water off to the right and attempts to swim away from the crocodile back over to the boat. But Ginger only made it two strokes before the crocodile suddenly re-emerged underneath her and grabbed her by the waist and pulled her under the water. Jane is just standing there watching all of this happen in front of her. She has no idea what to do. The crew is still not down in the dinghy, so she's totally stranded. And she's just staring at the area where Ginger has been pulled below the surface. And just seconds after she's been pulled under, the crocodile re-emerges with its head pointed towards Jane. And in its jaws is Ginger. And Ginger's got her arms up over her head. She's wide-eyed. And she's looking right at Jane. And Jane makes eye contact with her, but there's nothing she can do. And she just walks watched as Ginger again was pulled back under and this time she did not come up again. Ultimately, Jane would be rescued from the ledge. The crew would get down to the dinghy, they'd swing over, they would pick her up. And then about two days later, they would find what was left of Ginger's remains. It would turn out the captain was well aware of the threat the crocodiles posed in this river. And he had told his crew, Ginger and Jane included, about this threat and that at no point should anyone get in this water. But, of course, his warning went unheeded. The next and final story, so our top story of today's list, is called Blackwater. At 11.40 a.m. on December 21st, 2003, three young men who were longtime childhood friends hopped in a truck and began traveling south. They were 22-year-old Brett Mann and 19-year-olds Sean Blowers and Ashley McGuff. They lived in a coastal city called Darwin, which is actually the capital of the Northern Territory in Australia. The Northern Territory, also known as the Top End, is located in the central north of the continent. It is six times larger than the UK, but has 280 times less people living in it. Specifically, the UK is home to roughly 70 million people, whereas the Top End is home to only 250,000 people, and half of them live in Darwin. There are many reasons why the top end is so underpopulated, ranging from politics to poor infrastructure, but the most obvious reason that so few people choose to live in this part of Australia is because it is wildly rugged and dangerous. It is scorchingly hot year-round, and the weather in general is just unbelievably unpredictable and violent, and as the old saying goes, all the animals there are trying to kill you and each other. But Brett, Sean, and Ashley had grown up in Darwin, and so they were accustomed to the hazards of living in the top end, and so they weren't really concerned about them. What they were concerned with was finding things to do and not getting bored in the city. That particular day, in order to ward off boredom, the trio had decided they would head out to a salt flat that was located about 50 miles to the southwest of Darwin. It was this wide open plain that they could just race around on their quad bikes on. And so they loaded these quad bikes into their trailer, attached it to their truck, they hopped in their truck, and at 11.40 a.m., they started heading south out of Darwin. The first road they were on was this fairly desolate dirt road that wound around through the wilderness and it passed by the iconic eucalyptus trees that are very well known in Australia. It passed by palm trees and giant termite mounds. And after driving on this dirt road for about 30 minutes, the trio passed by the Tumbling Waters Holiday Park, which is a vacation resort for adventurous families. And then beyond this park, there really was no more civilization. They were headed right into the outback of Australia. And so this was kind of like the last mark of civilization. And so the trio, they drive for another 30 minutes past the park. And at some point, all of the trees on either side of the road start getting more and more dense until they begin kind of encroaching over the road as if it looks like you're driving directly through the heart of a jungle. And they would have recognized this change in scenery as meaning they were nearing the Finnis River, which was off to the right beyond all of the trees. So they couldn't see it, but they knew they were close. And the Finnis River was not a huge waterway. It was a 30 mile stretch that ran east to west through the top end. And what it was known for was being very brackish and dark. You could not see into this water more than maybe an inch or two. So it almost appeared black. 
And so the trio continued driving along through this kind of jungle atmosphere until the left side of the road began to thin out again, and then it eventually revealed the salt flats up to their left. And so at that point, the trio pulled off on the right side of the road where the vegetation was still very thick. And then the trio hopped out of the truck, they went around to their trailer, they dropped the gate, and one by one they pulled their quad bikes off, and then each of them hopped on and drove out onto the flats. That day, the flats were actually very muddy because it had recently rained really, really heavy in that area. And so the trio spent just as much time racing each other on the flats as they did trying to drive close to each other and spray mud on each other. And so for hours, they were out there having a great time. And then at 4.30 p.m., they decided it was time to call it a day. And so they drove back over to the truck. They drove their quad bikes up onto the trailer. They locked it. And then they were about to get into the truck to head back home when one of them suggested, hey, let's head down to the water and rinse our clothes off and get all this mud off of us. Now, you need to understand, in the top end, the place you want to spend the least amount of time in is the water. People in the top end assume that in any natural water body that is not clearly designated as a swimming area has at least one animal lurking in it that will kill you. This is a literal precaution people in the top end take. And so this section of the Finnis River that these three friends were thinking about going and jumping into and washing off inside of, this was not a clearly designated swimming area, and so it should be avoided. But you need to remember, these three guys, they grew up in the top end. They were used to living in this kind of wild area, and they'd also come to the salt flats so many times over the years, and they had jumped into the Finnis River before to wash off and go swimming, and nothing had ever happened. And so really, the idea that the Finnis River could be dangerous to them, it didn't really cross their mind. They felt like, you know what, we've been there, done that, nothing's going to happen to us. And so they left the truck and walked away from the salt flats into this mangrove forest that's only a couple of feet off the road and began walking towards this river. Normally, the trip from the road through the forest to the river bank, basically where the forest ended and you reach the river, it would take about 10 minutes. But after walking in this mangrove for maybe a minute, they were already standing in river water. It was only a couple of inches of this water, but it signaled to the guys that clearly the river is very swollen from all of the recent rains, enough so that it overflowed beyond its natural boundaries and it's flooded the mangrove forest. But the three guys, they look at each other and think, meh, what's the big deal? I'm sure we'll be fine. And so the guys continued moving on, but as the mangroves began to thin out, they began to slow down dramatically. But because the riverbanks on the edges of the Finnis River were very, very steep. If you were standing on dry land, if there was no flooding, and you were right on the edge of the Finnis River, if you took even one or two steps into the river, you would slip down under the water and the water would be over your head. Now, as these guys are walking, because the ground is flooded with this black, brackish water, they couldn't see the ground, and so they couldn't tell where the drop-off into the river was. And so they began to slow down, and then when all the trees were practically gone, they knew they were close, and then one of them actually slipped and kind of tumbled down the edge for a second, but he turned and he grabbed one of the roots of the mangrove tree and pulled himself back up. And then the other two, after seeing this, they walked over and stood next to him, and the trio just stood there looking out at this pitch black looking river that was very clearly moving faster than normal because of all this excess rain. But they kind of looked at each other and thought, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we'll hold on to the roots of these mangroves and lower ourselves over the embankment. We'll wash ourselves off, pull ourselves back up. No big deal. And so they each turned around and grabbed a root of one of the many mangrove trees that marked the edge of this forest. And while holding on, they would lower their lower half down past the embankment until they were submerged. And they rubbed all the mud off of themselves, being very careful not to let go of the mangrove at any point. And then as they were about to finish up and pull themselves back up and get back to their truck, when Brett loses his balance and somehow lets go of the mangrove root and slips down the steep embankment and Suddenly, the current takes him away from his friends and out to the middle of this river, and before long, he's getting pulled downstream. And so he yells out to Ashley and Sean, who had their backs turned to him. They turn around, they see their friend, and they instinctively leap into the river to try to go get him and help swim him back to the side. 
Now, all three of them were very competent swimmers, and so this was not a high panic situation. This was more like a inconvenience and maybe a little bit funny, and so that's why they leapt in no problem. They figured, you know, worst case scenario is we'll drift somewhere down there and we'll get out and we'll walk our way back to our car. But as soon as Sean and Ashley were free floating in this river, they felt how strong this current was, and it was way stronger than they were anticipating. And so they actually started to get a little bit worried, and they looked up ahead of them, and Brett, who had been in the water for, you know, 10 or 15 seconds before they leapt in, he had already moved way farther downstream than them. And so they decided, you know what, we have to get out, but we need to get to Brett first. We all need to get out at the same place. And so they decide they're going to swim downstream, meet up with Brett, and then get the heck out of that river as fast as they possibly can. And so they yell out to Brett to, hey, we're coming to get you. And they start swimming as fast as they possibly can. And with the help of the current, they manage to get all the way up to Brett relatively quickly, maybe a couple of minutes. And when they reach him, Sean and Ashley go in front of Brett. And then the three of them, they stop actively swimming and they allow the current to just kind of carry them downstream. And as they're drifting, they begin scouting the left side of the river for a solid clump of mangrove trees they can swim into. Because unless there's something to grab onto on the edge of this river, they can't pull themselves out. And so at this point, the trio is definitely uncomfortable being in the water because of how strong that current is. But they're confident they're going to find a viable landing spot and they're going to get out of here and it will be a great story. And so Sean is in the front, Ashley is right behind him, and then Brett is behind Ashley. And they're all about an arm's length away from each other. And they're drifting down this river for a couple of minutes. They're looking on the left side for a viable landing spot. And then all of a sudden, Ashley just yells out, Hey, I see something in the water. We need to get out. Find the nearest tree. Get out, get out, get out. And so Sean, he starts panicking. He doesn't even turn around to see what's going on behind him. Adrenaline kicks in and he swims as fast as he possibly can to a tree that's popped out of the river. It's literally growing in the middle of the river. And so he swims up to this tree. He manages to climb up to the first fork of the tree, which is maybe six or eight feet above the water. And as soon as he's up there, he turns around and looks down and he sees Ashley. He reaches down and he hoists Ashley up to the first fork with him. And then the pair turn around again to grab Brett, but Brett's not there. And so they look around, they're thinking, okay, did Brett not make it to the tree? Did the current pull him around? Is he at some other tree? You know, they're yelling out for him. They're looking for him, but there's no Brett. And so they're talking to each other, Ashley and Sean. They're saying, hey, did you, did he call out? Did you hear something? Did he give some indication about where he was going? And they're saying, no, I, I don't know where he is. And so they start climbing up the tree a little bit and trying to look down and up the river to see if maybe they can see him. And then all of a sudden, Sean notices something yellow flash beneath them in the water. And so he looks straight down and he sees this yellow thing down there. So he nudges Ashley and he says, look. And so Ashley looks down and as they're looking, they're about 10 feet off the water at this point. They see this yellow thing start rising up to the surface. Now the water is so dark, they really can't tell what anything is unless it is at the surface. And so they're watching this yellow thing and suddenly it comes out of the water and they see it's Brett. He's got his yellow jacket on. That's what they saw. And Brett is in the mouth of a 13 foot long saltwater crocodile. He is face down and his left side is being held in this animal's mouth and he's not moving. And so Sean and Ashley are so scared, they're just frozen. They're just staring at this monster that's in the water that's holding their friend underwater and they can't do anything about it. And for two minutes, they just stand there looking at this animal, wondering what's going to happen. And for those entire two minutes, the crocodile stared right back up at Ashley and Sean as if it was showing them what it was going to do to them once they got in the water. That I've done this to your friend, I'm getting you to as well. And so they're staring at this animal when suddenly it just kind of goes underneath the water back down into the black abyss and it, along with Brett, just disappear. Ashley and Sean are so terrified that they can't even grieve for their friend. They can't feel sad for him. It's like they just go into survival mode. And without saying anything to each other, they just start climbing up this tree as fast and as far as they possibly can. And they only manage to get up maybe a couple more feet to two more branches. One's at about 10 or 12 feet off the water and the other is at about 15 feet off the water. And so Sean makes it onto the lower branch and then Ashley makes it onto the slightly higher branch. And then once they're situated on their branch and one arm is firmly wrapped around the trunk of the tree, they're able to kind of breathe for a second and take stock of their situation. 
And even though, of course, the elephant in the room here is that their friend was just eaten by a crocodile, but it's like they can't process that yet. Instead, they start talking about, okay, well, our families, they're going to recognize our absence and they're going to tell the police and the police are going to launch a search and they're going to come find us. Both of them were confident or they acted confident that that was going to happen, but they also knew that there was no timeline for this. It could be hours or days until this actually happened. And so as these two teens are sitting on their branches, the reality of their situation really started to come crashing down on them. Because, yeah, they're safe in this tree, but how long can they possibly stay in this tree for? I mean, eventually, they're going to need to fall asleep. And if they fall asleep, are they going to fall out of the tree and land in the water with this crocodile? I mean, they just didn't know how this was going to turn out. And so as the two began comforting each other, you know, reassuring each other that, oh, no, it's going to be just fine. Someone's going to find us tonight or tomorrow will be just fine. As they're doing that, Ashley suddenly stops talking to Sean and just looks straight down. And so Sean realizes what Ashley's doing and he matches his gaze and he looks straight down. And at the base of their tree in that black water is the 13 foot long saltwater crocodile. It's back and it no longer has Brett in its mouth. They have no idea where Brett is. He's just gone. Saltwater crocodiles are considered the most aggressive and dangerous crocodiles in the world. And they are one of only two crocodile species that will actively hunt humans when given a chance. And so these two teens are helpless in this tree. All they have is some separation from the black water and this animal down below. And so they just find themselves staring straight down at this crocodile. And in turn, this crocodile just stares right back up at them. It's very clearly waiting for them. It wants them to come out of the tree so it can eat them. And so the crocodile just continuously repositions itself all around the tree. It's just keeping the top of its head out of the water so its eyes can look up at them. And so the teens are just praying that at some point it will grow tired of them and will leave. And after several hours, right as the sun is about to set, this crocodile does seem to give up on them and it drifts under the water and disappears. After a couple of minutes, Sean, who was on the slightly lower branch, decides he doesn't want to be any closer to the water than he needs to be, and he's going to climb up to Ashley's branch. And so he very carefully stands up on his branch, he makes sure he's got solid footing, and then he reaches up and he grabs a branch with his right hand, and he kind of tests it, and he feels like it's pretty sturdy, and then he puts all his weight on it and tries to reach for another branch when this one breaks. And as soon as that branch broke, Sean tumbled 10 feet into the water. So he hits the water, he goes all the way under, he sinks a few feet under, and immediately he's turned around and he's trying to swim as fast as he can to the surface and he's just expecting at any moment this crocodile is going to bite him. He gets to the surface and he looks around, it's a little bit dark, but he can immediately see his tree and he realizes the current has pulled him away from his tree. And so in a panic, he starts swimming and kicking his legs as hard as he possibly can to get back to this tree. And he knows the whole time he's kicking his legs, he's just attracting the attention of this crocodile, but he's got nothing else he can do. He's got no other tree he can reasonably get to that will provide safety from this animal. And so with every ounce of energy he's got, he kicks and swims. And finally, he manages to grab a root of this tree that his friend is still inside of. And he begins pulling himself with his lower half still submerged in the water. And so as he's dragging himself towards the trunk of this tree, he's just waiting for this crocodile to bite down on his legs. And finally, he gets to the trunk of the tree and he's able to pull his body out of the water and he clambers up to that original branch he was on. And then he and Ashley work to get him up to Ashley's branch. And as soon as he sits down next to Ashley and he's secure, they both look down and just a little ways away from the tree, basically in the area where Sean had just landed in the water, they see with the little light that is left, this crocodile swimming right back over to the tree and it camps out right underneath. Sean had gotten out just in time. When the sun finally did set about 10 or 15 minutes later, it became pitch black. There's no ambient light in this part of the world. There aren't any buildings or cities close enough to this area. And so it is truly pitch black. And so they could no longer see the crocodile down below. But they knew it was there because periodically they would hear it repositioning itself right underneath them. Also, because it was so dark, the two teens could not actually see each other. And so they began holding on to each other. And then anytime either of them moved, they would announce their movement to the other just so they knew they had not fallen asleep and were not falling out of the tree to a horrible death. 
And so a few hours went by like this where it was silence with the exception of the sounds of this crocodile repositioning itself periodically. A little after midnight, a huge storm rolled into this area and it began absolutely downpouring and the raindrops that were hitting the river were so loud that the teens could no longer hear the sound of this crocodile. And so they had no idea if it was still down below them or not. But every time lightning would strike, it would illuminate the sky for that flash of a second. And in that flash, they would look down and there would be the crocodile. After several hours of this super intense downpour, the two teens also started to become concerned that all this additional rain could raise the water level of the river all the way up high enough that this crocodile might be able to jump out and reach their legs. But because it was so dark, they couldn't actually see the top of the water, and so they had no way of knowing if the water levels were actually rising or not. And so they both kind of sucked their legs up onto this branch and tried to make themselves as small as they could while still remaining anchored to each other and also to the branch. And that's how they sat for the next several hours, just hoping they would survive the night. Finally, when the sun came up that following morning, the teens immediately noticed that the crocodile was still right below them, just lurking at the base of the tree, waiting for them. And they also noticed the water level of the river had clearly come up quite a bit. And so if they weren't rescued soon, there was a good chance that another heavy rainstorm, that crocodile would be in range of them and there was nowhere they could go. They were as high up as they could get. Not to mention the fact they were hypothermic, they were weak, they were tired. And if you fall asleep, you're going to fall in the water. And so the two teens, they knew they did not have much time left. Luckily, at 10 a.m. that morning, they heard the sound of a police officer who was out in the mangrove forest. It turned out their families had recognized their absence. They had called the police. And that morning, a search had been launched. They had found their truck and then had been walking down the river yelling out to them. And then they finally did find them. Initially, when they located these two teens stuck in the tree, they called in a helicopter to hover over them and lower down a ladder that could climb back up. But when the helicopter got close to this tree, the rotor wash from the spinning blades, it practically blew the boys out of the tree. And this crocodile was still in the water. The rescuers could see it. The boys could still see it. And so there was this fear that the helicopter would literally send them into the water to their death. And so they had to abandon the helicopter approach. However, the blades of that helicopter did ultimately scare this crocodile and the crocodile swam away. And so as soon as the helicopter was off station, they had a boat come in and the boat got right underneath the two boys. They jumped down into it and they were brought to safety. The two boys were brought to a hospital where doctors determined they were physically okay, but both of them were severely traumatized from what they had just been through. As for Brett, despite an exhaustive search of that river, they never found his body or any of his clothing or any belongings he had on him, and they never found the crocodile that... Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast with exclusive episode. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone chilling content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts, Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also, there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today, but in video format on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time. See you.